Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, today, Andres Monroy Hernandez is going to talk to us about designing for remixing computer so supported social creativity. Um, Andres is a postdoc at Microsoft Research where he works with our people. Um, he also graduated with his PhD recently from the MIT. I haven't defended yet. <laughs> not yet. Oh, not yet. Sorry, I won't take you. Um, from the MIT Media Lab, where he worked on Scratch and other online communities. Um, and he is a Berkman Fellow, so we're happy to have Andres join us, and I'll let him take it from there. Uh, thanks a lot, MR. Um, so, again, uh, my name is Andres Monroy Hernandez, and I guess this is an interesting crowd because I feel like a lot of you have seen my work many, many times. So, I apologize for repeating some things, but I'm, I'm hoping that I can summarize a lot of the the things that you probably have heard me talk about in the past few years. And for those of you who are new, um, I really welcome you know, uh, comments from anyone. And, and you know, feel free to ask questions as we go along. I'm going to try to leave some time for questions at the end as well, but feel free to interrupt. Um, so the focus of my presentation today is uh, trying to understand how we design systems that support remixing. Social computing systems that support you know, social creativity and remixing being part of this. Um, so just to give you some background, um, uh, first I'm going to try to explain or try to describe what I mean by social creativity and then give some uh, pointers at, at some of the motivations that have, uh, you know, uh, that, that, I, that drive some of my work. Um, so first, when we think about social creativity, you know, one of the things that we think about when we think about this in the context of online communities is, you know, websites like YouTube. Uh, so you've probably seen videos like this one. This is actually supposedly the most popular video on YouTube ever. Uh, at least that was last year. Uh, this is, you know, a video of a baby biting somebody else's. And, and you know, this is one example of the kind of uh, you, you creativity that you see or personal expression that you see online. Uh, and, you know, this video has 300,000 million views. It's a very popular video. But what I find most interesting about it is not so much that, you know, someone could upload a video and many people can see it. You know, we had that in some ways with TV before. Uh, but, but if you go to YouTube over any particular video that is popular, you'll see that there are tons of remixes. So this is, you know, a Kanye West version of the baby biting the finger. There is a Sparta, you know, this movie combined with the baby. Uh, there's tons of remixes, you know, people reenacting the, the baby video. Uh, so for any video you, you, that you see on YouTube, you'll find, uh, for any popular video, you, you'll find a lot of uh, remixes. And that's kind of like what I found really interesting about, uh, about YouTube and other systems. And, you know, of course, if you think about YouTube, you might also think about, you know, tons of other systems out there that not only video is one of the things people share. There is, you know, images like on Flickr. There is uh, video games like uh, you see on Newgrounds and, you know, text, etc. cetera. Uh, the point here is that, you know, there is tons of uh, websites out there that allow this kind of personal expression and that allow also for people to build on other people's work. Um, but, you know, you know, this is not a new thing. In fact, um, Johai Benkler talks about this uh, several years ago where he, you know, argue that this is not only a fad, but this is a new form of production. So he calls this the commons-based reproduction, and you know, he he argues that this is a new way in which people are coming together, building projects with each other. And he, you know, one of the the case studies here is the free and open source software movement, uh, as well as Wikipedia and other projects like that. Um, similar to that, you know, we have uh, people like Henry Jenkins who talks about the implications of these kind of systems for culture. Uh, and the argument is very similar. The idea here is that you know not only these large conglomerates or corporations will create culture, but also you know average people, amateurs. So he often focuses on fans and fan culture. Uh, and one of the stories, actually, this picture is of Heather. Uh, one of the stories in the book. Uh, this girl, if you remember in the book, if you read it, basically um, she created a, a newspaper online. Uh, she was a big fan of Harry Potter, and she created a, a newspaper for for Harry Potter where um, you know, she invited other kids to write stories uh, for the newspaper. And it was a very kind of active community of kids you know, producing content, fans of, of, uh, of Harry Potter. Um, and one of the interesting th things that happened is that uh, Warner Brothers, uh, the owner of Harry Potter, uh, kind of took legal action against the website and basically arguing that they were you know, infringing on their copyright, et cetera. And, you know, at the end, uh, they said, oh, whatever. But this, uh, Henry Jenkins argues, you know, points out some of these tensions that we see with these kind of uh, remix-friendly uh, systems. Um, one of the things that, that, that I find interesting, again, about social computing systems is this idea of building on other people's work. And remix is just one word to refer to a wide range of, of activities that you know, might have different names. So if you're a software developer, you might use the word fork. 
Uh, in fact, you know, if you look at GitHub, for example, or Git in general, one of the one of the reasons uh, it became really popular is because of its ease of uh, remixing and forking projects. Uh, but if you are an artist, you might use different names like you know collages, bricolage, uh, pastiche art. There's tons of different names for this idea of building something new out of something that exists already. Now, one of the questions is whether this is a new phenomenon or not. So some people like Lessig and uh, Lev Manovic argue that this is, you know, this is what we've been doing for many years. In fact, you know, they, they mentioned things like you know, the Roman culture was a remix of the Greek culture in some ways. Uh, so yes, this is a, an old phenomenon. But one of the things that other people argue, you know, like Adam Sinrich and others, that while it might be an old phenomenon, what we see now with these technologies is that now people are able to remix the content itself. So in the past, if you wanted to say remix Mona Lisa, you could sit in front of it and you know draw a version of it. But now, if you want to remix a video on YouTube, you actually grab the, the the bytes that produce that video, and you can make something out of it. You can use in some ways the original content. Uh, so again, this is not without controversy. So you know, if you saw a few weeks ago, you saw a lot of websites with this uh, ribbon. Uh, you saw Wikipedia going black. Uh, for, you know, in protest against uh, SOPA, you know, there's tons of discussions around intellectual property and, and what it means for this remix culture. And, you know, we might see SOPA today, but we'll see other things in the future, and we also seen things in the past. Um, so, you know, Lessig, when he talks about this, he says that there are, like, two extremes uh, around the idea of uh, copyright. So there is those, he says, you know, people who, who argue that, you know, kids are uh, copyright abolitionists who don't believe in copyright, who, are, you know, will copy anything that they see online. And you know the kind of people who are more on the extreme side of co pro copyright, where you know everything is has property and you should not you know remix. Uh, so that's kind of two extremes that he mentions. And one of the things that I find most useful about the way he frames this is that you know he, he describes uh, that these systems uh, live in the context of these four variables. So he talks about you know the law, for example. You know that you can argue that copyright law currently might not be as conducive to, to remixing. Uh, you can change that law, you can produce new licenses like the Creative Commons, but there's also norms around these communities. So like in YouTube, for example, uh, you could think about different ways in which people engage in remixing. Some people might want to ask for permission before remixing, other people might decide to do it just you know, by, by downloading a, a video. And in general, these communities do have certain norms that emerge out of the interactions that people have with each other. Uh, in addition to that, there is also the market forces around this. So, uh, you know, again, if you look at the example of YouTube, uh, you can see how remixing has changed over time on YouTube. So, in the past, you could just remix anything and, and, and upload your video. Now, uh, the, the content owners, the, the, those who own the copyright of content, have the power to decide how they can capitalize on the remixes of their work. So, if you are a, a, a songwriter or, or the owner of a song, if somebody uses your song on a video, you could get some revenue out of, of, out of the, the, the advertisement that shows up next to the video. Uh, but the fourth dimension is what I find most interesting, which is that this idea that the, um, the system itself, the architecture, the code behind these this, this, this social computing systems also helps determine the way in which uh, people engage in, in this kind of remix culture. Um, so kind of framing the kind of questions that I'm interested in, I'm interested in how we design these uh, systems that support social uh, and amateur creativity. Um, so when we look at those kind of questions, we often see, you know, focus. We, we often see people focusing on systems, uh, and and you know, one of the classic ones that we see around, you know, studying social computing is Wikipedia. And of course, you know, there's tons of articles and researchers who have looked at Wikipedia from many different angles. So that's one approach to study an existing system. Another approach is, you know, I've seen some people who, a lot of researchers who, who work around the idea of building your own system to study these kind of questions. So uh, there, is, there is a group in Minnesota, for example, that developed a system just to study how people interact on these uh, this kind of websites, uh, and they use this as a kind of laboratory to understand this. The approach that I took was somewhere in between. So I was trying to build a system that has relevance in kind of the, the real world, uh, as well as something that we could use as a laboratory in some ways. Um, so this is a, a, the Scratch online community. So it's a website that I developed uh, along with my colleagues at the Media Lab. And the, the Scratch website community, the Scratch online community allows kids to share their own interactive media. So anything from video games to animations to interactive art. And you know, share it with the world and create this in the context of a community. So I can show you. Um, Quickly here, uh, so this is the front page of the website. Um, if you see, you know there are tons of projects that are um, shared by anyone, you know many people around the world. There are again all sorts of 
you know, video games, uh, recreations, uh, stories, um, you know, uh, all sorts of projects. And, and a lot of the content that you see on the front page is curated by the community itself. So some of them are based on, you know, the most uh, liked project, the most viewed projects. Others are picked by the community members uh, manually. But overall, the community is kind of uh, managed uh, in, ground, in great part by, by the community itself. Um, when you look at um, you know a, pro, a, a particular page of a user, you, this is what you see. You see all his or her projects, uh, their friends, uh, some of their galleries that they create. These are spaces where you can um, share projects with other people, and uh, and you can also play with projects. So you can you know look at any particular project, play with it on the browser. You don't need to download Scratch itself, the editor. You can play with it. You can you know also. Uh, interact with other people leaving comments at the bottom of the page. Um, you, you can scroll there and you can see there's tons of comments. In this particular project, the kids playing with the project are leaving comments saying what the score was. Uh, other kids might ask, you know, how do you make this, etc. So you see a lot of interactions in this community. Um, there is, uh, so one of the nice things about Scratch is that you can go to any particular project and download the original source code and open it up in the Scratch editor. Uh, the Scratch editor is uh, an application kind of like Word where you kind of have to install this. Uh, and then you can edit projects, see how they were made. So this is how it looks from the inside, that, that project that I was showing you. Uh, uh, so you can you know, make your own versions of it and then re-upload your own particular uh, version of it. Um, so let me show you um, that particular project on the website. Um, I just wanted to show you a visualization that shows up when you look at the remixes that people make. Um, so again, this is the same project on the browser. Um, so if you scroll here, you can see that there are uh, a certain number of remixes. These are people who downloaded the project and created different versions of it. Um, you can see here, you know, th this is the project. These are all the remixes around it. And you can see, you know, there's tons of people. These are the names of the people remixing it. Um, one of them is this one. Um, so you can click on that one. That, that one actually was created around the elections uh, a few years ago. Uh, and you can see uh, that the, the person making the remix changed some of the images. So now instead of the spaceship, you have uh, the photo of John McCain. Um, and you can play with it. And actually, even the, the pictures of the, the spaceships around you change a little bit. Let me see. Uh, so this, you have Hillary Clinton there. So this is one example of a remix. You know, uh, And people here can explain what they did in the notes. So it says, you know. Sorry if this offends you. Uh, I look up to you. My version of Neo, you'll understand if you are an average American. I'm a Democrat, and I'm a Democrat, so I love this game. So you can see people really invest uh, a lot of time, you know, changing things, and and, and in some cases, uh, and uh, making the project kind of personal based on their interest. Um, um, so the, the the project itself, Scratch itself, uh, is a is an educational project, and. And the goal is many, it has many goals. One of them is to, to understand remixing. But the other one, kind of the core idea behind Scratch is to provide an environment that allows people to create things that are personally meaningful to them. And this is based on uh, an educational philosophy called constructionism. Uh, started by Seymour Papert uh, back in the 80s, uh, where you know, there's a long history of, of software for, for kids that is uh, based on this idea of you know, creating tools that allow kids to express themselves and to build things. And as they do this, they learn you know, math, computer science, uh, all sorts of design practices. Um, more specifically to the online community, which is the part that I'm uh, kind of more involved with, uh, I was really inspired by Ivan Illich, who wrote a book back in 1970. And it's a really interesting book because this was written before the web existed. And one of the things that he describes is that he argues that we need a new form of uh, schools. Like he argues that schools are kind of broken. Uh, and he says that what we need is a web, a learning web. Uh, and again, this is before the, the web actually existed. So he argues that we need a le learning web whereby you know, people, peers, will connect with each other, talk about you know, what they're interested in, you know, uh, build on other people's work, have, an access, have access to a repository of existing you know, projects or, or books in, in the case that he was referring to. So I find it a really inspirational model because in some ways that's what we see with a lot of these new systems. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that, that he came up with uh, many years before the, the web. Um, so now in terms of you know, what people are doing with Scratch, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the kind of things people are, you know, the, the, the numbers in some ways behind Scratch. Uh, so there's more than a million accounts now. 
Uh, we released this about four years ago, well, almost five years. Uh, about a quarter of them are people who created a project on the website. So they share a project uh, uh, that they created and, and they put it on the web. Uh, some of them create projects and they might not share them, but about one fourth of them uh, have shared a project. Uh, there is more, uh, more than two million projects now. Uh, so there's a lot of projects on the community. And one interesting thing is that about 25% of them are remixes of other projects. So this is projects that are based on existing projects. Uh, another interesting thing is that about 71% of the people uh, who created a remix, the very first remix they did was actually the very first project. So you, know, you, can, you can see that remixing is, is a way for you know, advanced people to build on, on existing work, but also newcomers who might just want to you know, play around with Scratch and you know, look at somebody else's work and build on, on it. Uh, so this is also a, a, a very useful way in which people engage in remixing. Uh, in terms of you know, the activity per month, we have about a million visitors per month. Um, it, we have about 65,000 projects a month. Uh, about, uh, again, like the, the rate of remixes over time has stayed pretty steady. Um, and there are about 28,000 new users also every month. Uh, in terms of who, th who these people are, uh, it's primarily kids. So it's people uh, between you know, 8 and 16 years, age, 16 years of age. Uh, it, there is a spike around eight, 14 years old. Uh, but you see there's a lot of people that you know, are in their 20s and 30s. Uh, in fact, a lot of them become kind of uh, engaged in, in Scratch because their kids are using Scratch. And then they, they really like it. And actually, there's this case of, a, of an engineer who is retired. He lives in, in, in Maine. And he introduced Scratch to his grandkids. Then he became really in, in, into it. And now he's one of the moderators of the community. He helps other kids. So he's a really active member of, of the community. So we see a lot of cases like this where you know, adults become engaged in the community because they find this a space where they can you know, show their expertise and help other people. Um, yeah. What's the meaning of this color? Oh, yes, good question. So the blue one is uh, boys, and red is girls. Yeah. Um, in terms of where people are coming from, you know, people are from, coming from all over the world. Um, you can see that, in fact, London is the, the number one city in terms of visitors to the site. People from Australia, even pe people from coming from uh, countries that don't speak English, despite the fact that most of the people in the community speak English. Um, and, uh, this is a question that I often, I, I've been asked a couple of times, you know, who are these people in terms of ethnicity? Uh, so in terms of US visitors, and this is data from a website called Quantcast. Uh, it's a very similar website to Google Analytics, but here they provide you know, additional demographic data. Uh, so you can also install this little JavaScript uh, code and, in your website and get some extra information. So you know, we have about 66%, 76% who are Caucasian, 7% uh, African American, uh, Asian 5%, Hispanic 10%, and 2% other. Uh, on, on that side of the, sc of the screen, um, you'll see this chart that shows you the internet average, so how much you will expect uh, people on the internet uh, compared to what you have on the website. So you, you can see that in some ways Asians are overrepresented on the community as well as this category of other and Hispanics a little bit. Uh, so this gives you an idea. I mean, this, these numbers are based on, on a series. Uh, they don't really explain how they get these numbers, but from what I read, they, they get it from a combination of a toolbar and they also hire some families like Nielsen kind of families and they combine all this data and, and present to you some aggregate. Um, one of the interesting things that happened in the community early on was uh, that some kids started to share projects like this one, where the goal was primarily to um, you know, share sprites that other people can, can reuse. Uh, so in this case, um, you can see in the, in the description of the project, it says, you know, here are some simple walking sprites. So each character is a sprite. Uh, and it says they're perfect for platform games. Um, and then it says, if you want a sprite of your very own, you can leave a comment in my gallery and say what you want, and I will do it for you. Um, be patient, because it might take a few weeks. Uh, and then says, she says, I'm very busy. So this is a project that she shared a girl in the UK you know, early on in the community. And the idea was not to share a final project, but to share a, you know, elements that other people can reuse. Uh, so a few days later, this girl posted this comment under the project. And she said something like, you know, could you make a mountain background? Uh, and then she said, I'm going to give it a love it. Uh, basically, on every project, you can love it if you like it. And she said, I'm going to give it a love it and put it in my favorites uh, in case I need more sprites for my, for my miniature company, Crank Inc. So she started to describe she has this company. Uh, and she said, it's not a real company. It's just one that I made up. Uh, she said, we make really good quality games. 
Uh, I made only two so far. I don't want to make rubbish ones. Um, all you do is simply send a project, uh, and I will review it back. And if it's good enough, uh, I'll add you to the to the to the com company. So these two girls started to collaborate. The girl responded with the request. They started to work together. Uh, so they started to get a lot of attention in the community. So other kids wanted to join. So they had to uh, set up a process for application because they got a lot of a lot of applications. So that you had to submit a, a portfolio of all the projects that you have made. Uh, you have to explain what are the kind of projects that you will be interested in making and helping with. Uh, so after a while, they they created this kind of more established uh, group of people in the community. They came from all over, uh, and these are some of their roles in in this particular group. Some of them were programmers, some of them were designers, uh, animators. So you know they, they had kids from all over the world, but you know at some point they couldn't grow infinitely. So they they basically asked people to to stop requesting access to this, this company. So other kids kind of disappointed. They created their own company. So now it's kind of like a thing that people do in the community where you can make your own groups, and it's a form of participation in the community to to do things with other people. And one of the things you do is you you kind of establish a common goal, and then you exchange projects as you go, and you remix each other's work as a form of you know building on on existing work that other people in the group are doing. Um, one of the, the things that I wanted to look at, uh, when we, once we reach a lot of projects, about 2 million projects, I wanted to look at you know, what are the most popular scripts. And the scripts in Scratch are kind of like paragraphs in a piece of text, you know, uh, cohesive pieces of code that have some meaning. Uh, so these are some of the most popular ones. Um, so you, know, you could expect some of them uh, already, where uh, things are on, um, you know, when I press this, this character, it should move to the right or to the left, things like that. Uh, but one of the things that I was really puzzled by was this one, uh, which is a, pro a, a particular s uh, script that uh, now that I look at it, it it's uh, related to projects that are about scrolling, kind of like Mario games where you know the characters scroll. Uh, so I was really curious on how this came to be, because there are many ways in which you can do scrolling. Uh, why is it that this particular form became one of the most popular ones? And it turns out that uh, one of the kids that was involved in that company, he created a, um, a, a, this, this technique for scrolling. And since then, you know, he's made a lot of tutorials and he's made a lot of projects that explain other people how to make it. And now it's become the kind of the, the standard of doing scrolling. Uh, so you know, it's pro perhaps one of the most remixed uh, forms of, of code that you might see on the community. Um, so this is one of the examples where you can see some of these uh, trends become also you know like the standard way of doing things on on Scratch. Um, in addition to that, you know, since a lot of people started to notice this need for for creating and sharing more kind of granular pieces of, of, of work, and not just projects as a whole, but also individual sprites or scripts. Uh, there was one of the kids in the community who created a website. This is, this is the one, uh, Scratch Resources, where you could upload your own images, you could upload your own sprites, your own kind of little elements that could help other people uh, create projects. So this is a, pro a website that this kid made, and kind of we coached him and supported him through the process, and now he's like running this on his own, etc. Uh, so it's one of the examples of kind of user innovations that we've, we've seen around the community. Uh, kind of going back to some of these uh, companies, we looked at a particular company and trying to understand what role Remix in play in interactions in this company. Uh, so we looked at this company over the course of three months. Uh, they created about six games uh, in, in this period of time. And each game in particular, uh, on average, took about six, 17 remixes to make. So this is uh, people were exchanging you know, pieces of code or, or, or projects or, um, or characters in order to make each project. Uh, so you can see that remixing really plays an important role in, in kind of collaborative efforts that are already kind of established, not only like these ad hoc uh, kind of collaborations. Uh, so just to kind of wrap up in terms of the, the remix part of it, um, you can see this is a kind of a, a journey through remixes, as we call it. Uh, this, this, is, this kind of shows you how one particular project led to other projects. So we start with this project by uh, this girl called, uh, the project was called The Jumping Monkey. It was a very simple game uh, where this monkey goes around this, the screen and you can control it with the keyboard. It had some bugs, but it was a very compelling game. Uh, so then this other kid kind of downloaded that and, and remixed it. And one of the things he says is that, he says, you know, I made some simple modifications to K-Doodles. K-Doodle was the previous uh, person. Um, I added pink slippers, so it's a technique that he invented to add these little uh, shoes to the to the monkey, so that he could detect when he's touching the each line. Uh, and then he says, you know, I um, 
I, you know, this is perfect for other kind of platform games. Uh, so, you know, he established here, you know, the fact that he used a previous piece of work and he made some improvements to it. Uh, a few weeks later, um, this other kid made a new version of that. So this is another kid. He's a more kind of sophisticated user. He's been longer on the community. And he says, you know, hey, I made, um, I adapted uh, this, this project from Kduro. I used the shoot technique that they have. And I made this project. This project got, actually got a lot of attention in the community. It was a very kind of professional looking game. And, and it got a lot of you know, views and activity around it. Um, so a few days later, this other kid who makes more of a kind of Nintendo looking games, uh, he made this version of the same project. Uh, and then he says something like, hey, Wiz, which is the name of the previous kid, uh, I love this game. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind me making some changes to it. And then the other kid responds. Uh, he said, no, no problem. And then he says, you know, in fact, I'm looking for someone to, to join my production company, so and so. So they kind of found each other via remixing through, uh, then they, through remixing, they kind of found out that they had similar interests or similar kind of skills. And they kind of decided to form this, this group, this collaborative group. This is an example of kind of remixing evolved into different uh, shapes and forms uh, as, as a kind of as a core aspect of the community. Uh, but again, you know, remixing, uh, it's very uh, popular in the community, but it's also a, a, a source of tension. So we often see comments like this one, where kids start to complain about other kids remixing their work. Uh, so, you know, things like copycat or plagiarism, or even comments like this one, where they become kind of more aggressive and say, you know, I really don't like when people copy my, my, my projects. So we started to look at that and, and see, you know, what we could do about it. Um, and one of the things that, that we saw is that, you know, comments like this as well, where people kind of explain more of what's happening. So he says, you know, I'm Charlie. I'm the original creator of a project called Luigi Disco. Uh, so and so Jay copied me, and he didn't acknowledge me. He didn't change anything I wrote or drew. And he says, if, Jay, if you're reading this, you should think about other people. So we start seeing this as a kind of common form of people uh, expressing their, their concerns about remixing. Um, one of the things that we saw also is that just like people created these companies to make projects, some of the kids started to create groups to fight uh, plagiarism. So this is an example of the Copycat Cops, which is a group that goes around the community looking for projects that might be pl uh, cases of plagiarism or remixes that they, they don't approve, and they flag them as inappropriate. They know that if you flag a project, it gets deleted or you know, it, it can be deleted for some time. And, and so they kind of do that as a kind of form of crowdsourcing uh, uh, the, the policing of the community. Uh, so we looked at a bunch of projects, um, about three, three, more than 3,000 remixes, uh, pairs of remixes and original projects, trying to understand what are the kind of responses that people have towards it. Uh, so we found that, uh, you know, we, lots of people, you know, have random comments, but with those that express uh, either positive or negative, they were about the same. So about 22% of the people uh, expressed some clearly negative comment about remixing, and 21% of the people express a you know, positive comment about uh, the remix that somebody else made of their own project. Uh, and a lot of people just didn't leave any comments. So these are the distribution of uh, you know, the, the blue side is people who leave comments, and the pink one is people who just look at the project that somebody made out of their own project, and they don't make any comments. Uh, but those who make comments, you know, they are distributed um, somewhere in between the positive and the negative. Um, so one of the things that, that we saw is uh, you know, one of the kids suggested that maybe when you download a project, uh, it should automatically give attribution to other people. So the idea here is that you know, m perhaps people are forgetting to, to give credit or something like that. Uh, so he, this kid suggested a solution for that. And he said, you know, why don't you give credit automatically? Um, so then we actually implemented that. Uh, so when you look at any particular uh, remix, you'll see something like this. And then you see at the bottom the name of the creator and the name of the person on which the project is based on. Um, so this is an example of, of you know, what we did. Since we have access to both the, the community and the tool, you can easily track where things are coming from. Uh, so then we tried to look at what was the effect of this, uh, whether it worked or not in some ways. Um, so we found that you know, attribution actually didn't make any difference. So people were still you know, complaining, uh, or people who didn't say anything also didn't you know, continue being silent. Uh, so that you can see here the, the you know, uh, the, the two sides, the no attribution and automatic attribution, the percentages of both of them are pretty similar. Uh, so we were trying to understand why is that, that you know, 
these are market attribution didn't really make a difference. So we started to look at the projects themselves and the nodes that people leave in the projects. Uh, so we found that some of the projects had nodes like this one, where it says, you know, I created this project by remixing so-and-so's project, kind of trying to give some kind of uh, credit to the person who, who they remixed from. Uh, so we wonder if that was the, the, the kind of the, the difference, that, that maybe leaving this manual node actually has some impact in the way people respond. Uh, so then we looked at, again, the same group of projects, um, and then we looked for the presence or the absence of these manual credits that people might leave. Um, and then we did find a difference. So basically what you see here is that the people who were silent kind of stopped being silent and they became more positive towards Remix. And they say, you know, oh, thanks for acknowledging me. This is great and so on. Uh, people who were negative basically stayed the same. But overall, we saw a slight uh, difference in terms of whether people leave uh, this manual credit or not really has an impact in the way people perceive or respond at, at least to, to the remixes uh, of their own work. Um, so then we wanted to understand this better by actually talking to some of the kids who use the community. Uh, so, you know, we interviewed a bunch of kids, we presented to them some kind of cases um, where we show them like either fictional cases or real cases in the community and asked them what they thought about them. So this is an example of one of the cases. Um, we asked, how, how do you define remixing to one of these kids? Um, and this is what the kid said. And then, do, and then changing a lot of it and sharing it and giving credit. Mm -hmm. You can see that he explicitly says, you know, a good remix or a remix is defined by doing this, this, and this, and giving credit. And then uh, one of the things that I did was, you know, I presented some um, cases on paper and say, you know, what do you think about this case? And this case was one where peop one, one person didn't actually leave uh, credit. And, and I asked him, what do you think about this? This is a remix of Red's project. Full credit goes to him. Right. Then I then I would consider it a remix. Mm. But this is definitely a copy. I see. So you can see people kind of started to argue on what the difference between a copy and a remix is. So now one of the things that we've been uh, we started to do now is to look at you know this concept of uh, originality. And the idea is you know as the kid mentioned you know part of it is whether they leave credit or not. Another part is whether how different it is from the original one. So we use a method from software engineering where it's a very simple method for determining how much of a new object uh, comes from a previous object. So in the case of code, you will count the numbers of lines. In the case of Scratch, we looked at both code and some of the media, whether the media came from a previous project. And this is something that we just started looking at. And what we found is you know, uh, about 19% of the projects are actually exact copies of previous projects. The rest have somewhere in between, you know, zero percent similarity to ninety-nine percent. Um, uh, so that gives you an idea of the of the range of of of, uh, of remixing or originality that you might see in the community. Uh, the median remix is about eighty-six percent derivative. So that means that eighty-six percent of the content of that remix comes from a previous project. Um, so this is just a, 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 a new area that we are exploring, and one of the things that we want to look at now is uh, look at you know, what they call edit distance. So to see uh, how much of the actual code, not how much is um, uh, derivative from previous work, but also how much of it was changed. So sometimes uh, people might not uh, add things, but they might actually remove things. And those things were not accounted in this, in this particular uh, case. Um, so we are looking for better ways of, of measuring this. But overall, the idea behind this is to try to measure, to try to measure the, the ways in which people uh, might you know, engage in remixing across the originality spectrum. Um, now, one of the things that, that we also did, uh, kind of thinking about uh, status in the community, uh, in order to support remixing more, uh, kind of trying to diminish, uh, to, to lower the number of complaints in some ways that we hear, uh, is to use uh, the, the front page itself as a way to support remixing. Uh, so let me explain. So in, in the front page, when, when you go to any page, uh, on, on the, on the, when you go to the front page, you'll see a bunch of different sections. So a lot of those sections are you know, ways in which people get, uh, in some ways, famous in the community. So uh, when your project gets viewed a lot or when your project gets uh, commented a lot, uh, it goes to the front page and you know, stays there for a few days. So it really becomes a source of status in the community. So we decided to do something with remixing uh, on the front page. The idea was that you know, we could show 
uh, the most remix projects on the community and as a way to, to kind of encourage people to, to feel positive about remixing. So if you create a project that gets remixed a lot, then it might be on the front page. Um, so we did that, and actually what happened is that uh, it changed the way the community responded to our remixing, uh, but not necessarily in, in the way that we expected. So traditionally, uh, remixes uh, look like this, where you have a project, you have tons of remixes around it, uh, you know, you have maybe five levels at the most, uh, and, and you know, basically a lot of people get that project and do something with it. What happened when we introduced this, this particular kind of top remix section on the front page is that it changed the nature of remixing by having people create projects that are explicitly encouraging others to remix. So like remix chains. So a lot of them were uh, asking people to, you know, that, please download this and add your name to these this projects. Uh, so this is an example of them. This is actually the project with the longest kind of number of chains in some ways, or number of uh, links in the chain. Uh, this is a project that, that basically asks people to download and add your name to the left if you are a girl uh, and to the right if you are a boy. Uh, so it's a very simple project. You will download it, you put your name, and you upload your own version. Um, so this actually generated a lot of you know, remixes in the community, and that's exactly what this person wanted because this could lead you to be on the front page. And so this is now a new form of remixing that has emerged in the community as a result of, of this uh, particular intervention. Uh, in addition to that, we also saw the emergence of these contests. Uh, so some of the kids started to create um, contests around this idea of the remix chain. So the, the idea was that you provide an animation that doesn't have any color, uh, and then invite other kids to remix that and, you know, and create this kind of uh, a form of uh, competition around who will make the best coloring version of, of, this, of this animation. Uh, so one of the interesting things are, around this is that the kids participating in these type of remixes um, had, had to kind of create a form of incentive to, to remix in addition to, to you know, uh, being part of this, of this group. A lot of them decided to, for example, if you win the contest, you are going to be a star in the next version of their project. Uh, or you could get a request. So here is a, a, a chart that w where we looked at a bunch of different contests and what are the types of awards that the kids offer to the winners of those contests. So you can see that the most popular one is a request, where you as the winner can request to me as the person who organized the, the contest to draw anything for you. And that became a really popular form of kind of exchanging in some ways uh, these kind of gifts on the community. Uh, the other one is, of course, Lovitz, which is like, more of a currency. You, you could think of it almost like money in the community. Uh, and the third one is, you know, to be a star in, in the project by somebody else. Um, so this is uh, one example where also remixing, uh, adding this, this, this kind of form of remixing on the front page, it started to create this new trend of contest around, you know, uh, uh, remixing. Um, kind of to conclude, I just want to wrap up with kind of an a, a overarching description of the different elements that you might think about when thinking about remixing systems. Uh, so first we have you know, the structure of the system itself. Um, you, you can think of, a, of any particular remixing system as uh, having different uh, values within these kind of dimensions in some way. So for example, Scratch itself, in terms of attribution, which I've been mentioning a lot, it, you know, at the beginning we didn't have any automatic form of doing attribution. Now we do, but you know, there are all these tensions around the automaticness versus the, the manual credit of it. So this is one aspect of, of, of the remixing system that you might think about when designing this type of system. Uh, the other aspect of it is you know, how easy it is to decompose a particular object that you see, a particular artifact. Uh, in the case of Scratch, as I show, you can download anything and see how it was made and reuse a lot of those, those pieces. And those pieces themselves might have different uh, degrees of granularity. So some of them are you know, very uh, specific, very small, a line of code, a block of code. Others are you know, uh, objects as a whole, like you know, characters in a game. Uh, but you know, Scratch itself has its limitations on how granular it is. In fact, on the Scratch website, we only allow to share projects. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why this other kid made a project that has more, a website that has more granularity. Um, in terms of openness, um, you, know, you can think about the licenses in these systems. Uh, or how welcoming they are to remixing. In the case of Scratch, we decided to use the Creative Commons license as a kind of default for all the projects uh, with the idea that we will support uh, remixing more. Um, you know, in terms of the way people uh, use remixing as a, as a kind of functional form, um, 
you know, you can think about the, some of the examples that I show where, you know, some people are either inspired by other people's work, but they actually don't use the actual bits of the, of the work, all the way to people who make exact copies of, of projects. Uh, uh, and, you know, a lot of things in between from people who just use a particular component of a project to people who make an incremental change, uh, like the case of the coloring contest, uh, or people who kind of rebuild almost the whole thing using the original elements of a project. Uh, and in terms of the kind of collaborative aspect of Scratch, uh, it, it also serves a function there. As I show in a lot of the examples of the kind of collaborations or companies, uh, you know, some of those are about, you know, groups of people coming together, trying to make something together. Others are about two individuals working with each other. Uh, others are about like large groups of people, like the uh, kind of um, the, the chains that I show. Uh, so it serves different purposes on, on that kind of aspect of, of, of the function of remixing. And finally, in terms of, um, you know, what are the different attitudes that we might expect from people on a remixing community? Uh, you have, you know, originators of projects might be anywhere from, you know, really encouraging other people to remix uh, all the way to being explicitly opposed to remix. Uh, as I show, like some people are really not okay with remixing no matter what. Uh, in terms of uh, the person who is doing the remix, uh, we might think about, we might see different forms of, of uh, engaging in this form of remixing. So, you know, there are people who are very cautious of following the norms of the community. So people who are, you know, say, okay, in Scratch, it's all about, you know, giving credit to other people, perhaps in, in certain sub-communities of Scratch. Other people who are too cautious about, uh, about remixing, who might not even engage in remixing at all as fear of, you know, of some kind of retribution. Or people who actually ask for permission before uh, remixing. Uh, and all the way to people who are actually using remixing as a form of trolling or, you know, being annoying to other people. A lot of kids are, you know, remixing and say, this project I made it and it's actually, it's mine and it's actually not theirs. And they use this as a form of annoying other people. So we, we kind of see a wide range of, of, of um, attitudes toward remixing. And I guess just to, to finalize, the idea behind this is just to see, you know, what are the different structures and functions and, and, and kind of responses that we might expect from people that might help the design of other systems out there. Um, and with that, I just want to open it for questions or comments that you might have. Yeah. Mm. This may have been one of your earlier slides, but can you describe the, how you got to that critical mass that you got to? What mm -hmm. was the number? You have uh, up over a million accounts. Right. So how did you do the initial, how did you get the word out initially, and then how long did it take to get to a million? So we, when we started, we basically did a bunch of workshops with kids here in Boston as a way to kind of seize the community. Um, later on, we, well, so there are multiple ones, so multiple kind of ways. One, another thing that we did, we did workshops here in Boston, outside Boston, and we also disseminated with a lot of, you know, educators, teachers, etc. cetera. Um, one of the things that helped a lot is at the beginning, we got a lot of uh, attention in the media. So there was like an a, a article in Slashdot, and, you know, um, the BBC had an article also. Uh, so I feel like that gathered a lot of attention from parents who are interested in, you know, techie parents or geeky parents who are like, oh, I'm going to show something to my kids. So that was kind of the first wave of Scratch users. And I feel like nowadays it's more of um, uh, people who are coming from schools. So a lot of schools are now using Scratch as part of their curriculum or after school centers. And so kids find out about Scratch at school or one of these centers, and then they use it at home. And then they also show their friends. So now I guess it's kind of like um, the schools and the more structured forms of education that are helping gather a lot of momentum around Scratch. And did you provide actual materials? Schools? Did you do like so at the beginning we didn't actually, and one of my colleagues, uh, Karen Brennan, uh, he, she is basically focusing on that. That's her, her work, and she's, you know, developing uh, curriculum materials for teachers or helping teachers share the, the, the materials that they, that they create. Uh, she created a website called Scratch Ed, um, where you can share this kind of work. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of infrastructure, I guess, around it. Yep. Um, amazing, thank you. I'm wondering about if you uh, learned anything about how children age. Uh, how they participate in this community, and through time, how they would change their profiles of remixing versus originating, copying uh, uh, versus initiating, um, and if and if at all you can make conclusions about how such a system could be redesigned for a type of um, learning how to both how to ultimately how to balance remixing and originating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess for the first part of your question, I don't have a numbers exactly, but I do have a lot of you know anecdotal evidence that shows that. Um, 
a lot of the kids who start in Scratch who are very young, they tend to disregard a lot of the norms, or they, you know, they don't even know what the norms are in the community. And actually, I remember this case of a kid who made a remix of somebody else's work, and it was almost an exact copy. So the other kid kind of complained and was like, "Hey, why are you doing this?" And he's like, "Oh, sorry, I'm only, you know, eight or it was he was very young." <laughs> and and the other kid, the, the older one, he's like, "Oh, I'm sorry, you know, I understand that you're just learning, but here this is what we do and so on." And later on, I saw this kid d developing a more, you know, clearer understanding of, of what the norms in the community were. And now he's one of the most active members in the community, and you know, he has a very kind of clear idea of what's okay and what's not okay in the community. So you see this evolution over time, more as a, as a function of how long they've been in the community, more so than age, at least in the context of Scratch. And then what, the second question you had was about? Well, I think that there's an amazing parallel to the sort of information diet stuff that Ethan is working on at MIT, right. which is the, the other side of what you consume in terms of media is what you produce. And so I'm wondering, for the, for the kids, how you encourage in the redesign of a remixing system a kind of a balance of what you produce. Some cases you produce things that are total derivatives, some cases right. you produce things that are total originals. And if you put any thought to the, the media, you know, the farmer media uh, as right. opposed to the consumer of the media. Yeah, I guess we haven't done anything around that yet. But one of the things that is in the in the process uh, is um, so one of the issues around remixing, I feel, is that it's often really hard to see all the work that went into making a particular project, either a remix or a non-remix project. Uh, and so I feel like making that more salient might help people be more aware of you know how much work or how much uh, you know different changes people uh, did in order to make a remix. One of the things that I notice is that a lot of the uh, reactions that people have to remixing are primarily based on how projects look more so than how the programs are inside. Um, and actually, this is uh, an interesting phenomenon that we observe is that a lot of the people who are kind of very much against remixing are those who are more interested in art. So a lot of the kids who come to Scratch not because it's programming, but because they want to animate their works or you know they are into drawing, so they want to do something with the drawings. And those people are really against remixing. And I think part of it is just a cultural difference, perhaps. But I think, I imagine that if we show more of the process that went into making any particular project, people might be more appreciative of like, well, maybe this person didn't change any of the media, but they changed a lot of the you know, code behind. And that might create different forms of appreciation for remixing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in uh, what you said about Creative Commons licenses. Which co license do you use? And do you explain this to the kids? Mm -hmm. uh, how does that work? Right, I can show you. Um, we use the Creative Commons uh, attribution share alike version. Um, and so we, when you go to any project, um, let me just click on this one. Uh, it shows here. I mean, it's not. Uh, so here it says some rights reserved. And when you click on that, we have a kind of a version of, of the license that we try to make it a little more child friendly. I mean, I, I assume a lot of people don't even read this, but we kind of come up with a story around like bake, baking and so on. Um, and that's definitely something that people read once they get into issues with other kids. Uh, people don't really read it ahead of time, but once, we, when, once they complain or once somebody complains to them, they often, you know, we often sh either show them the license and try to explain to them what it means. Uh, and but even a lot of kids, even after reading it, they still are well. I don't agree with that, and that's kind of a difference of opinions in some ways. And um, what ends up happening is that either they leave the community. A lot of kids who are actually like, there was this girl who was really prolific. She was uh, one of those kind of animators, and she started to get really upset when people remixed her. And she complained to us, and you know we kind of kept explaining that the, the goal of the community was to allow for remixing. She finally decided to stop being a member of the community, and she moved on to uh, DeviantArt, uh, which is a website where you can share only graphics, but that's what she was interested in. Uh, so it definitely creates some conflicts. And that's something that I feel that is still not clear to me what to do. Like, on the one hand, I have this idea that the website will be this kind of free and open source software environment for kids, where we all share this ethos of, of openness. But at the same time, there are some people who are just not interested in that, and you know what to do with them. either. You know, in, perhaps we should allow people to select different licenses, or perhaps that should be a different community. It's an open question. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That was very interesting, and you know, tracking this kind of level of creativity that happens in this young age is fascinating. The thing that you may be interested in, to know is um, some early history from the world of uh, Photoshop. Mm -hmm. So Photoshop was developed around the same time uh, with uh, the web, but 
it became popular before the web. At that time, communication was happening with something called Gopher. Mm. You would just put in a server. So there was uh, a large community of artists who used to uh, uh, do what they called collaborative art. So somebody would put in this server, uh, you know, some design they did, mm -hmm. and others would take it and change it in some way, and then would mm. put it back. And eventually, after a few years, actually, you could see the whole uh, tree of creation and which ones became more popular as starting points. Oh, nice. You know, I will wonder if actually we can find some mm. repository of all of these things. Um, there is a website called Aviary. I don't know if you've seen it. Uh, it's a Photoshop-like uh, tool that is completely web-based. And what is interesting is that uh, as opposed to when, when you look at a Photoshop project or a, an image made in Photoshop, you see the final version of it. But what they do is that they show you all the elements that were used to make that particular image. So you can track down, if somebody reuse one element of that image into some other image, you can see where it came from. And again, it seems like it's similar to, to that thing that you were mentioning. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I guess last semester, uh, Mako argued that Wikipedia. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> hi Mako. Um, <laughs> you argued that Wikipedia was successful because people kind of understood what encyclopedia articles were, and that NPOV was something that, although it's really difficult to describe, you kind of know what it is. Scratch, on the other hand, is a really successful like online community where people are doing really innovative designs. I'm wondering, like, why that's worked given what Mako has said. I guess it's different because I feel like in the case of Wikipedia, the idea is that hundreds of thousands of people come together to create one single object. And in that case, I feel like the idea of like knowing what is it that you're going to make an encyclopedia helps a lot in defining that goal very explicitly. While in the case of Scratch, it's typically small groups or the majority of the projects are actually individual, individuals making projects. Uh, and individuals do, like they might want to create you know, a new version of a game that they know or you know they have their own ideas, um, so I feel like the distinction there is you know how many people you want to get together to make something big, uh, and I feel like depending on the number of people, you might require a more uh, higher degree of specificity in what the project is about. The way that kids, they're not familiar with. I mean, they're also not familiar with what encyclopedias are, right. uh, or anything else. So. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, ha have any kids uh, or any of these, you know, so-called companies, mm -hmm. uh, either as individuals or groups, gone offline and started to become, you know, app developer companies or mm -hmm. become actual real-world software developers? Yes, yeah, some of them. So one thing that I've seen is that some of the kids decide to, they kind of get over Scratch in some ways. They are like, okay, I kind of know everything that is to know about Scratch. And they decide to hack Scratch itself. So they learned this actually really obscure language called Smalltalk uh, that was used to make Scratch. And they started to um, make their own versions of Scratch. And from there, some of them started to make, you know, uh, you know program anything from websites to you know, apps as well. Um, and there is this software called Google App Inventor that is kind of inspired by a lot of the ideas behind Scratch that you can use to make apps for Android. So I feel like you, you start, you'll start seeing more of that. And you know, of course, some kids be, become like experts at you know, professional uh, programming languages as well, and they develop their own apps. But, but nobody's tried to sort of monetize their, their, their Scratch company at all? I don't think so, no. Yeah. No, I don't think so. Yeah. yeah. How does the Scratch community interact with the proprietary culture from outside of the Scratch community? Do they apply the same norms, or is there a distinction? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I feel like there are two sides of, to that. So one is that um, kids in general, when I ask some of these questions in the interviews, they are, they feel very happy to remix from, say, Disney or whatever they see online. In fact, when I ask them, how do you get some of the media for your project, they say, I just go to Google Images and I get it from there. <laughs> and they see Google Images as the source. It's not really where it's coming from. Um, so they're very happy to do that. And, and I ask them, you know, what do you think about remixing Mario from Nintendo and so on? And they say those are big companies who cares, you know, they don't suffer or anything. But when it comes to somebody in the community, they, they have more of a nuanced reaction toward that. Uh, in terms of the outside world reacting to Scratch, uh, you know, like any other, you know, user-generated content website, uh, we sign up for uh, the DMCA, you know, um, uh, protection. And we've gotten a couple of companies, in particular Namco, who uh, complain about some of the versions of uh, Pac-Man that some kids have made. And they sent takedown notices for a couple of those projects, and we had to remove them 
uh, but it created a lot of uh, uh, interest in the community around copyrights. A lot of the kids were like, let's do a boycott against Namco. And they said, oh, yeah, it's actually remixing as a form of, of protest. They were like, remix this project if you are against Namco. And you know, they had some kind of mini version of uh, kind of an activism form in, in the community. So we've seen all sorts of uh, reactions, both from within the community and outside the community, you know, about these ideas of the clash between the openness of Scratch and the kind of more closeness of the outside world. like this uh, is a great venue for teaching young kids to pick up programming and languages and teach them that they can actually create something on their own. Is there any sort of advanced scratch that would point kids in a specific computer programming language, for example? Or well, the, the, there's not a version of Scratch that does that, but there are other software very similar to Scratch. One of them is called Alice. So Alice was developed at Carnegie Mellon, and it's a really good so, uh, piece of software if you want to learn something that is a lot closer to Java. So a lot of the structures are very similar to Java, and in fact, it's based on Java. So, um, so that's one example. There is also um, a similar software for developing Xbox-like games called Kodu. Um, so this another, similar to Alice, you can develop like three-dimensional kind of games. Uh, so those are two examples. There is a bunch of other you know, more uh, I guess closer to programming, like professional programming languages, and you know, uh, processing in particular. I feel like it's one of the nice, uh, you know, next steps after Scratch b before you get into a kind of fully fledged uh, software environment, software development environment. Yeah. Yep. I'm wondering how the moderator moderator system works. Mm -hmm. Are they all adults, and how are they working? Yeah. So we have a combination. So moderation, the way it works is combination of community moderators. Uh, moderators that are adults part of the Scratch team, as well as the communities as a whole. So any project that you see on the website can be flagged as inappropriate. And then you explain you know, why you flagged it. Um, and automatically, um, if a project gets flagged many times, it gets taken down. And when that happens, then a group of adult moderators uh, goes and looks at that project and will revive it if it's actually not inappropriate. Uh, so that's one way. Uh, we also have um, this idea of community moderators who are kids who have a little bit of kind of power in the community. It's mostly kind of moral status in the community. So they tend to be kind of uh, more of the, the kind of people who will intervene in the form of comments and trying to, you know, when there are fights between different members of the community, they can uh, op put an opinion out there and people will listen to them more so than a traditional kind of member of the community. So it's a combination of different, you know, functions that each each person can, can serve in the community. For the kids who are not moderators, do they have higher seniority in the community? Yeah, so at the beginning we picked a couple of them manually, so we invited some of them. Uh, later on, the community itself requested that we made this an open kind of process, so it became an election. So the, there's an election about every six months to pick moderators, uh, so the kids nominate themselves and then people, all the kids vote for them and so on. So that's how it is now. Yeah. Yeah. So is there a way for the participants to communicate with sort of you other than through comments? Is there some forum? There is, so there is a discussion forum, okay. that's one of them. But the discussion forum is primarily designed to be for kids to communicate with other kids. Um, then there is also a you know, contact us forum that people can use to send us messages. And we do. In fact, so one of the things that became obvious uh, after, a, after a few years is that you know, it will be impossible to manage all these things with just one person. So we actually hire a full-time you know, community moderator um, who is now in charge of this. And he actually also has other people who help him um, manage all this influx of, of comments and you know, messages that we get. Yeah. I'm wondering that in a lot of online communities, there's like a kind of like cultural literacy that like makes you, marks you that you're a member of the community, whether it's like 4chan or Reddit, like you know how to make this meme or you understand mm -hmm. like what this meme is. So I'm wondering in the sort of, you're promoting a kind of literacy, so I'm wondering like in the ecosystem of internet communities, like how permeable is Scratch to like these other sorts of, whether it's 4chan or Reddit mm -hmm. or Wikipedia, yeah. do they have their own memes, do they adopt other memes and sort of remix those? I think or? a bit of both. So I've seen definitely the Nyancat implementation on, on Scratch and things like that, like people taking uh, other communities' uh, practices into Scratch. Uh, but also I've seen a lot of emergent uh, forms of, uh, you know, cultural icons in the community. So one of the most popular ones, I remember, uh, there was this girl in New Zealand who created this character called Maki Duck, which is like this lizard uh, character. 
And at the beginning, I thought it was like a character that was from a TV show or something like that. Uh, mainly because a lot of other kids started to create their own versions of this lizard, and they become they they call themselves the Takis and so on. Uh, but I realized later on that she actually invented this thing, and it became a thing in the community, and and it's something that then left scratch and move on to others. I saw now there are people drawing the Makita kind of character onto DeviantArt and other communities for kids. So you do see a little bit of that. I guess you'll see a lot more of like the larger online community uh, world coming into scratch. But you do see some of these emergent uh, cultural icons going into other places as well. Yeah. well thank you.